Inside Outside Innovation is the podcast that brings you the best and the brightest in the world of startups and innovation. I'm your host, Brian Ardinger, founder of InsideOutside.io, a provider of research, events, and consulting services that help innovators and entrepreneurs build better products, launch new ideas, and compete in a world of change and disruption. Each week, we'll give you a front row seat to the latest thinking, tools, tactics, and trends in collaborative innovation. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. I'm your host, Brian Ardinger. And as always, we have another amazing guest. Today, we are recording one of our IO Live sessions with legendary Fernando Garibay. Fernando is a record producer, songwriter, DJ, entrepreneur. He was the official music director for Lady Gaga's Born This Way Ball and producer for her Born This Way album. He's worked with some amazing artists from YouTube to Britney Spears. And now he's working with some amazing corporate giants as the founder of the Garibay Center. Fernando, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm a huge fan. You're one of the best interviewers I've come across, so I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Thanks very much. And you and I met about a year ago when I had a chance to come out to your studio and see your process of how you create a hit. And so I wanted to have you on the show for a couple of different reasons. One, to start things off, the world has changed dramatically in the last two months, and we're entering what I'm calling the Great Reset. Old models are not working, old ways of thinking the status quo are being disrupted. And I wanted to have you on the show to talk about the creative process and how the business world needs to awaken its creative side and how you're doing that at the Garibay Center. How did you move from producing some of the biggest hits in the world and working with some of the best artists on the planet to pivoting and working in this corporate innovation environment? So it's really interesting. It's what the Garibay Center is all about and why I founded this arena, what I call a new paradigm. And just to clarify a couple of points. One point is, I still leverage and create content for the purpose of not only expanding and supporting and showing proof of concept that our model does work, but also to stay active in the creative community and stay creative myself. Second point, what gives me relevancy in this climate and culture of innovation and why I started working with corporate sector is because I realized none of what we do as individuals, as human beings, is soul dependent. It's not one person. It is community growth. And as I realized, working 20 years in the music industry at the highest tier, I realized that if we become an island and we only create content with the purpose of expanding brands, so to speak, creating music and focus on creating music and not really focusing and diversifying our creative portfolio, we're limited. And what I realized is besides access, right, on all sides, like musicians are always creating at the highest levels. Every day, they're in the trenches being creative. Where is another value set that we can use that creativity and apply it to outside businesses besides entertainment industry, you see? Mm -hmm. And it's a projection of myself because I I am completely polymathic in my approach. It's all subject. It's all sectors of business. It's all entertainment. It's all combined because creativity is creativity. Creativity is you find a new path to work every day because you are creative and looking for different novel ways of creating to work, theoretically, right? So that's just a very simple anecdotal version of what creativity is. Having hit records, having the success, it got really empty and vapid for a while because essentially I was defining my success by the hit records I have. And that's a very common problem. So what I decided to do is shift the creativity and what I do every day. Mm -hmm. And all that's happened in my career is I've evolved to look at this and adopt this orthogonal perspective is all things are related in a theory of emergence and chaos. Everything is related, right? So how can we utilize our skill sets of being creative and apply it to the corporate sector? How can we apply our creative attributes as musicians, as actors, as artists, as entertainers to use those lenses and solve problems? Now, that sounds like a really high abstract, intangible goal, but the reality is it's possible when you have Elon Musk tapping into the creativity of the Philharmonic Neuroconductor for his design idea, so to speak, then you start to see that there are people who are hungry for different lenses. And so my goal was to educate the entertainment and arts and music industry, find mentees who are interested in being entrepreneurial minded. So they can not only create music, but learn the Harvard Business MBA course, learn the Wharton MBA course, learn the Oxford Neuroscience course, which I 
distill in a way that musicians and artists can understand and apply these frameworks to expanding who they are as individuals, but also expanding their output. Think of the Garraway Center as it brings relevancy to these artists as thought leaders. And it comes from this crucible of thought. If you look at the greatest thinkers of all time, from Einstein to Galileo, you start to see a correlation with musicianship. So they were musicians, right? Einstein was a violin player. And you see this, start to see this correlation. You can make this connection that individuals who are creative, have creative expression, such as an instrument or et cetera, have this ability to look at things differently. And all I'm doing is giving them the vocabulary to be able to do this effectively and to have this discourse now and sharing the creative ideas. Now, not just in making music or photography, et cetera, but also applying those skill sets to design, to helping corporate leaders to think through their problems in a different way, aligning academic professors and the academic community to also apply this creativity in a different orthogonal way so that when we bring value to each other. So think of a Garibay Center as a best-in-class academic, corporate, and entertainment industry working together to solve real problems. Let's get tactical and talk a little bit about how that actually works. One of the things I, I liked about you and the session I went through was how you brought the business side into the creative process. So can you talk about how do you go about creating a hit? And you know, working with an artist, what do you do? How do you use metrics and analytics and that to craft that and talk us through that process. Okay. In order to do that, I have to kind of define a few terms, right? And so what is a hit? And so we define a hit as when you successfully connect your content to a mass participating group, identifying a target audience and then connecting with them on a genuine, authentic level. You've done that, you have a hit. If you want to go in music entertainment industry, you look at such metrics as billboard or charts, et cetera. And they show you on Spotify streaming numbers, they show you who you've connected with successfully with the help of a machine, such as a label and publishing, marketing departments, et cetera, a machine to expand your content, to distribute your content. Or independent artists relying on the virality effect of something like TikTok to become a create a launch pad for your content to successfully connect with your target audience. Without getting too technical, that's kind of a summation of what a hit is. Now, we realize that the same model applies to brands. And we realize the same model applies to corporate leadership. When we look at the connection between what an artist does, an artist is essentially a creative brand, uh, postulating a narrative. That model, like creating a hit for that brand, is the same as creating a hit for a campaign for Gillette, for P&G. It's all the same framework. So what we did very early on the Garibay Center is what I did was I was case setting every single artist I've worked with and looking at their emotional tone of their brand. And remember, brand is just a word. It's a simple over-contextualized word that where we can compartmentalize how the public sees who they are. So I just rebrand in that context, not so much as a soulless business old ideological perspective. You know, as I case study these major artists that I worked with, it was always about launching the next single. What's the next single going to be about and why? What's the purpose? Most of the artists that I worked with were always socially impact driven from YouTube to Lady Gaga to you name it. And so it was always about telling the right narrative to help their audience identify with who they are, or maybe, you know, helping the audience identify who they are as individuals. So it's, multi-level. So it was a process in which we ideate ideas, right? Create content, go back and test it and see if it, it works well within our a &R team. I started seeing the correlation between the creative process of creating hit records with ideals, design thinking, Stanford design thinking. I started seeing agile in this. I started seeing lean manufacturing in this. And as I look at these corporate structures, frameworks, I started implementing and organizing the creative process in a way that can be scaled and can be taught so that we're no longer shooting in the dark. Okay, we're going to go in and try to create a hit record. And where do we start, right? No, no, no. There's actually frameworks for this. You can go right. in and be more tactical about it and still be even more creative because the creative energy is focused in a structured way. It's well, way more fun than having to guess work your way through it. So that's what the Garibay Center did. Now we use those same frameworks and teach them to corporate executives and academics equally. So we may co-study and figure out new novel ways of solving problems using this creative process. 
Hey listeners, we wanted to pause this episode and tell you about our sponsor, RSM. In this fast-paced environment, you need an advisor who thinks ahead and rapidly responds to your challenges and changing needs. And RSM is that partner. With audit, tax, and consulting services, RSM is your business advisor who takes the time to understand your industry, your goals, and your opportunities, then works with you to turn innovative ideas into reality. Find out more at rsmus.com slash io. Are you seeing artists adapting some of these lean startup techniques as far as early experimentation, working directly with the marketplace to understand what works, what doesn't work? What are some of the things that you're seeing? What I'm saying is they've always done this. Way before Agile and IBM and Microsoft started implementing some of these frameworks, and all I did was connect, uh, you know, these uh, correlatively, you know, similarities so that I may give some context to what they do. And by distilling this, some might say, why would you overcomplicate things? Well, actually, no, I'm just defining what they're doing and clarifying what they're doing so that may, others may understand and take advantage of the ability of the creative community to provide novel solutions and new ways to approach things. You see, creativity arguably comes from divergent thinking. New ideas come from divergent thinking. And from my case studies, most of the artists I worked with come from an extraordinary amount of trauma, which led to a different way of seeing the world. If I may teach and help use this talent that comes from extraordinary circumstances to see the world differently and distill that so the world can utilize these skills that they've learned and practice every day, to express themselves, to express new ideas, to test on the market space in real time, right? Launch a single and discover, hey, that's not working. That's not connecting. Let's go to the next single. Let's create new content immediately because that's the world we live in now. It is a quick testing, right? Quick failing, quick feedback. And that's agile, right? It's back and forth. And that's also design, customer centricity, et cetera. And that's what's really valuable now. And I know we touched upon this previous when we, you and I spoke. You know, we're at that time now where... It's like the Darwinian effect of how we evolved as a society to be more technical. We are now living online more than ever before. And this process, this evolution has happened where we have to migrate to the cloud. We have to now migrate and having these Zoom conversations and and lectures and conferences, et cetera. This is new. Now all of society has migrated by force So we pushed and nudged society to a whole new paradigm in which is putting an end to the knowledge worker, Peter Drucker's knowledge worker. And now we're entering a fully engaged creative hemisphere, right? We are now in a world where you have to be creative to excel. And who better than to tap the entertainment and art musicians, photographers, et cetera, to share how they've been innovating every day of their lives 24-7 for years. And that's what I'm excited about. So let's get a little tactical. What are some of the resources or life hacks or things that you've used or your artists have used or, or even the companies that you've worked with to mm-hmm. accelerate their learning in this particular space? One is empathic circles, empathic spaces, empathic rooms. So when I'm working with an artist, I have five minutes, right? The caliber of artists that I work with don't have a lot of time. And their attention span is short because they have to have so much focus on other things. Running a machine like that with the major artists is very complex and requires a lot of thought. And if the artist is driving that, then they have to allocate time. So what I do, how do I capture attention? How do I get people? The most important thing you can do in a room is get people emotionally engaged. How do you engage the limbic system? This is very valuable in leadership, in corporate leadership, which requires extreme empathy, right? And yet... The traditional corporate leadership structure, it lacks empathy. And that's kind of a theoretically, right? Like it's known to not really know about each other's personal lives, how they feel about things. It's more about like uh, directives, right? Traditionally. Now that's changed completely. Now people realize in order to be creative and have novel ideas, you have to engage the limbic system. So that's always been the case in the music industry when I work with artists is I have five minutes back to this point. I gave myself five minutes because I knew by that time, on average, I start to lose their attention. So what I do is immediately when I went with an artist, I ask questions. And what's the first question I typically ask? Something like, 
you know, an, an artist just got off tour, right? So the last thing they want to be is at my studio and, or they just had a big show, had a, numerous interviews. The last thing you'd want to do is hear about more music, depending on their headspace. So what I ask is, what's your favorite song of all time? How has this song changed who you are? Or what does this song mean to you? And I have not had one circumstance where they have not answered honestly. Or I'll ask something like, you know, what was the performance that made you want to do this for the rest of your life? Something as delusional as chasing this dream of being a 0.0001% to be a successful artist. And the answer comes in a form of like, it was Wendy Houston when she sang this one song at the, it was Madonna when she performed at the MTV Music Awards, right? It was that, that change, that was the, the pivotal shift to their perspective, how they would see the world from now on. When they start talking about this, it's a prefrontal limbic system shift. Their body expression changes. They're all of a sudden back to when they were nine years old, seven years old, eight years old, and they saw the U2 or they saw Green Day perform and they wanted to do that for the rest of their life. They had their calling. So I just tap into those moments and it's the same for executives. It's the same for management. It's identifying purpose or re-identifying purpose or showing that purpose evolves. It's not static in those moments to create an empathic environment within the space you're working in. That's extraordinarily powerful and valuable because what that does, it gets the leaders in the room or every individual in the room to get engaged on a deeper level. And I'm sure most of us now watch the Phil Jackson, ESPN, The Last Dance. That's a great example of what we've been doing from day one, right? When we do have writing sessions, we're in a room sharing our deepest moments, right? And that's every day with strangers because we work with different artists every day with different writers. So what I framework is a tactical model that can be taught so that people can engage themselves at a genuine 100% honest level, like who they are, why they do what they do, and how can we create meaning for us and how can we create meaning for our brands, our community, so we may make a social impact and create change in the world. That can happen in any room. Absolutely. And that's inspiring people towards action. We're going to open up for Q&A in a bit here. You've been around, again, some of the most creative individuals on the planet. Are there particular attributes that stand out or skill sets that these folks have that differentiate them and put them at that 0.00001%? What have you seen? That's one of the core essence of why I started case studying, uh, you know, the artists I've worked with. And I want to be careful how I answer that because in respect to the artists and how, how extraordinary each one is in their own unique way. The universal attributes that, that I was able to recognize is divergent thinking. It is divergent thinking coupled with the ability to get rid of that wall. Let me explain. Majority of the artists I've worked with have had traumatic events happen to their lives, as most of us have. Yeah. Now, what they were able to do is translate those traumatic events to create meaning and purpose in their life. I was bullied, so I'm going to take that and help others that were bullied too. Or I was abused by my parents, so I'm going to take that and make that my drive so that I can share that I can overcome, that no one can stop me. These commonalities of triumph using divergent thinking coupled with the themselves, that combination was like lethal. That cut through all the noise that aligned with their dedication to their craft. So let's just add that too, right? So it's divergent thinking, authentic selves, and extraordinary ability to not only craft, but to harness the skill set so they may apply it to these two principles. Are you seeing things differently now? Like as the world's changing, as the entertainment world's changing, how do you see what you're learning and what you're working on? How's that going to change as this new world's changing? That's the now, right? So yeah. I mentioned before, I, think, I believe the Darwinian effect is incredibly advantageous. I mean, think about this. The world just hit a pause button. What a great time to take advantage of that in a way where you can better yourselves, right? Here's what I do. And here's what I recommend everybody do because not only has it worked for me, but it's worked for so many people that we've passed this on to. 
And that is educate yourself, right? I mean, imagine if in a perfect scenario, you can put a pause button on the world so you can learn as much as you like about bettering yourself and bettering your world, bettering your family's lives, bettering your community, the lives of people, right? By educating and understanding and giving yourself the tools to learn how people have failed in the passions that you have so that you may not repeat those failures. How powerful is that? Audiobooks, podcasts like yourself, Brian, who are educating the world and giving people these hacks, these life hacks to better themselves and better their community and better their leadership. My favorite anecdote to this is Peter Drucker, the father of modern business management at the Harvard Business School, who no longer is with us, obviously. But he had this idea that would work for a corporation thought process works for a family. Well, it works for a family to succeed, healthy, growth, you know, loving, empathic environment works for a corporation. Isn't that powerful? Well, these things are like what you pick up as you learn and study and do audiobooks and listen to podcasts and just follow your passions. Let your curiosity be the motivator. You know, curiosity is painful, right? Like that's, it's a little tinge of pain. That's what drives the brain to perform right? And to learn. So use that as motivation to define what your purpose is. And listen to these great authors, such as Stephen Pinker, Nassim Taleb, Noam Chomsky, Alan Watts, you name it. Like there's people out there who have gone through what you've gone through and have carved a path. So why not go there? That's what excites me. That's a great transition because you've been in this industry for a while and you started very young. Somehow you found early mentors and early folks that were able to help guide you through that industry and give you a path in that. What kind of recommendations or thoughts do you have for folks starting out, whatever it is, whether it's the music industry or new startup, that can help them find mentors and find that network and find that learning mechanism that accelerates their growth? Yeah, that is a great question because I think throughout the history of entrepreneurship, the history of the arts as well, and the history of science, it's always been driven by mentors. If you look back from Picasso had a team, right? He mentored like, and every major individual left a footprint on this planet came from a process of mentee and mentor. And the key is, here's the hack. I highly recommend, first of all, you find somebody that you can model yourself or you look up to, at the very least, look up to. And the key to having a mentor is it's absolutely essential. This is why I'm talking about it, is to make sure that you have a give back. I would highly recommend you never approach your idol or who you want somebody to mentor you with, can you help me? I highly recommend you approach your mentor, your future mentor with, how can I help you make your day easier? Here are my skill sets. have, you know, these skill sets, maybe they can apply to you. Anything I can do to help you make your life easier, I'm here to do. I'm a huge fan of what you do. I am happy just to observe. You can spend a little time just to answer my questions here and there. I'm available for you. I don't think any mentor is going to be able to turn that down unless they're completely like just. <laughs> All right, let's go to some Q&A. So if you have any questions from the audience, feel free to put it into the question box here. I've got a couple of things here. My dream is to work with Fernando. You're so talented. <laughs> it's not really a question, but congrats there. <laughs> question on, have you experienced anyone deflect your disarming approach? Like, how do you overcome that? You got a very charismatic approach that really is disarming and it's different than what you traditionally see in, in a business setting. That How do you go about making connections quickly? A lot of practice. I think it comes from my background. So my father was an extraordinary eccentric man. He came from a factory, you know, blue collar laborer. I mean, we grew up in, in some difficult times, but what he would do, even though our family was struggling, he would feed homeless people every day at our dinner table, breakfast table, I should say. And that taught me a lot because, you know, he would introduce them as family members. And he talked about all sorts of races, all sorts of gender preferences. It was everything, right? And so I would ask questions, you know, as a kid, you know, I was like an uncle from like the Middle East. I didn't know we had an uncle. Like, this is bizarre, like random people. But my dad was very giving. So I learned how to connect with everybody by looking for universalities, right? We all get hungry. What a basic principle to start with. I started to be able to see behind the illusion that people give their front because everyone has one. We are protective of our inner core. What I do is I just put it out there, like immediately. It's about sharing your flaws. It's about like just being authentic, man. Like 
did that come naturally or did, how do you break down the barriers of saying, okay, I want to be authentic, but like you said, there's all these reasons why you don't want to show your core and that. So how, did, how do you overcome that? Well, I'm going to, I can just test this with you. We had an earlier panel today and one of the members says, I struggled with depression. Okay. I'm in a room and that's a great example of vulnerability, right? So it's like a, what I call these vulnerability gestures. We all marry each other in a circumstance, right? We're a product of the people we surround yourself with, not only in life as, as a whole, but at the given moment. We're all marrying each other, right? Essentially. So the key is to use that. I'll get in a room with the C-suite at Microsoft, C-suite at whatever, or I'll be in a room with, you know, a major artist and it's universal. It's like, it's as simple as how do you get over when you're not having a great day? You know, I'm honest with like what's going on in my life. My brother just got over COVID, you know, and you know, yeah, I was terrified. It's as simple as that. And sharing that aspect, immediately people engage. Oh yeah, me too. You know, and the biggest, easiest starter in a creative community is a mental wellness, right? What I call mental fitness. I can see you're having a difficult time. Am I presumptuous to say you're having a difficult time right now? And they will answer, right? So I kind of cast out uh, genuine, vulnerable pitches to people in the room. And so what I say is in my studio and my creator space, I throw myself under the bus all the time. I want to be the one run over first. So I can get you to be in touch with yourself. And that's what it is. That's why I don't have people who turn me down. Another question in here. What does your daily routine look like as a music producer? What are your biggest challenges in life? I split my time up between creating and making music. Why I do it, it's interesting because it keeps me sharp. It keeps me in the trenches with my creative class. I spoke with a lot of professors who guided me to these courses on my own. Uh, I'm an autodidact. I, I learn on my own and they've guided me. And what I noticed is I asked them, why do you teach when you can do? And this is a very general question, but and the answer they gave me is, it keeps me sharp, right? So you have these Harvard professors, MIT professors, Oxford professors that are telling me that they write books, but instead of promoting these books or instead of working at, uh, in the corporate sector, or et cetera, there's nothing wrong with that either one, but they chose to stay and teach because it keeps them in the trenches, right? So that's what I do. And I try to split my time between working and write, produce records while I teach. I teach other producers and songwriters while I do this. And then I create a farm system in which they teach others. And then equally at the same time, I teach them how to be uh, orthogonal. And what I mean by that is they learn the Harvard MBA essentials. They learn the Wharton School of Business essentials. They learn Stanford Design Thinking essentials. They learn the Oxford Neuroscience essentials. See, all these things are relevant to how they create. And then we start the conversation and invite people to solve problems together in the music industry, along with, again, the academic and the corporate sector. So I divide my time between making music, teaching, the lecturing, and spreading the gospel of the Gary Bay Center and what we're doing alongside our, you know, Generator and, and you know, Procter & Gamble, et cetera. And eventually do a DJ set here for fun here and there. But <laughs> it's really all over the place. I stay active. So I mean, be better to serve people. All right. One of the questions we got time for maybe one more. You have a compelling way of describing the act of creating music as being driven by making an impact or coming out of adversity. Have you ever debated with anybody about music for its own sake? This person's saying, because my answer to this song that first changed my life might be a song that just had a new or awesome sound to it that pleased my ears. Is there a subtle answer or a way to get to that deeper meaning? I get this question quite a bit and i I have a grasp on this. Let me, let me try to answer this with empathy because it's important. For me, I'll give you a case study. For me, it's named after ABBA. It's a song called Fernando. My dad didn't have a name for me. There was this nurse who, when I was born, said she loved the song named Fernando by ABBA. So my, my dad went out and bought every, every record from ABBA. And so, you know, I've been hearing it since I was, uh, I was raised. And so if anybody knows uh, like pop music and the history of pop music, ABBA laid out the framework of what pop music really should sound like. Every pop song you hear from the majority part of European pop music and American pop music has had this framework of these choruses, right? This court, verse, chorus, verse, pre-chorus, chorus model. So that music still to this day has an imprint on me. It's kind of like music tends to leave an imprint on an individual. Art tends to leave an imprint. It gives people narratives. It gives people a sense of direction, 
a sense of meaning. It's what's so powerful about art is it can define your path and your trajectory and the story you're going to tell yourself about your future and who you are on this earth and this planet. That's so powerful. Music, art can be, and this is why it's essential that we harness that creativity, that prowess, and share it with the world. To answer your question, I think it's about the music, for me, that defines who you are, who you can be. That's the most powerful thing that I've learned about creating music and what it does for people and with people. Some people see it as a form of therapy. I believe, you know, according to neuroscience evidence, I see it as a language. And the more you learn how to speak in your artistic language, whether it be music or painting or photography or acting, the more you're able to express yourself using your language, right? And it's all it is, right? Behavioral therapy is communicating. It's similar. You can see it as therapy, but if you adopt the perspective that it's like a language and you're becoming a better speaker, you can be more effective at communicating with your therapist, whether it be your audience or your A&R, your manager, whoever it may be, or your marketing campaign, et cetera. It's all the same thing in my head. And I believe that for me, gave me structure to create these frameworks again, to teach people that, hey, this is so valuable. What you do and who you are is so valuable to the world. Let us help you identify that for you to live out your version of success. And that's important, Brian, right? Defining your success because there's different versions of success. We don't have to model our success after what's out there right now. We can create our version of success on a novel version of ourselves in the future. Well, Fernando, it's always fascinating to have you on the show and to talk about some of the things that you're seeing out there in the world. If people want to find out more about yourself or the Garibay Center, what's the best way to do that? Uh, TheGarabayCenter.com, Fernando Garibay at Instagram, Fernando Garibay at Twitter. Be creative in how you reach out to me. And that's how we identify talent that we can fast track, right? And the key, again, my mission is to create a thought leadership paradigm in the music industry, in the arts community to align and share their intellectual thought leadership prowess. And that's the big goal is the new value prop that since we live in a creative world, why not bring the creative class along for leadership and thought leadership? That is the most powerful thing I think I can contribute to this world at this moment. As the world changes, we definitely need some additional thought leaders and new ways of thinking about uh, everything. So I appreciate you coming on. If people want to find out more about InsideOutside.io, please go to our website. We're going to continue to do these IO Live events. Uh, Next Thursday, we have Henrik Wehrlin, who is the founder of BarkBox and also PreHype. So join us for that and sign up for our newsletter and be part of the InsideOutside.io community. And thanks for coming out and joining us. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Thank you for your wonderful, wonderful interview. That's it for another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. If you want to learn more about our team, our content, our services, check out InsideOutside.io or follow us on Twitter at the IO Podcast or at Artinger. Until next time, go out and innovate.